So I'm gonna cue this up or frame this a little bit in two ways. Um, there was a, a, obviously a, a large research component to the Canadian Water Network. And uh, I've read a book uh, recently that I would encourage everyone to read. It's, um, it's called Action Trumps Everything. And it's around the concept of when we were young, we would um, act, learn, and then we would repeat. So by trying things. And the concept that the, the author's term is called creativity. So you're creating things, you're reacting to it. And so it's not just research for the sake of pure research. It's about get out there, try things, be an entrepreneur, do it. Don't just think about it. And that's one of the imperatives, uh, the calls to action, I think, that Bernadette has offered to us here. Let's just not get together and talk about things. Let's, let's rise to the challenges here and act. So creaction is kind of where are we now? What's happening in the present? Another thing that I've read recently was around Moving with wartime speed, there's a book called Plan B, Mobilizing to Save Civilization, I believe it's called. And the concept of moving with wartime speed I thought was really interesting. There's, a, there's an urgency around this. I spent most of my career as a project manager, and time is of the essence. You know, the taxi meter is always ticking in my book. And the longer it's ticking, the more expensive it's going to be for us to, to do things. So what is that vision of the future? And Backcasting is kind of the act of you know setting your goal and then plotting steps backwards to that. So in the spirit of backcasting and mobilizing with wartime speed and being creative, I'm going to invite our panelists up here now to join me on the stage, and I'm going to turn it over to them for a, I'm sure what will be a stimulating discussion. So I'll ask uh, Gemma Bogue to come up. Gemma is a member of the Canadian Water Network Student and Young Professional Committee. She works as a policy analyst at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Environment Policy, policy uh, Division. And she's also worked on water and environmental issues with non-government organizations at municipal, national, and international level. Thanks for joining us, Gemma. Natalie, I'm probably going to say your last name wrong, Chris Dejecki, University of British Columbia, has a PhD in pathology and laboratory medicine from UBC. She leads the Enhanced Water Quality Assurance Program and leads a number of initiatives and research projects related to the application of molecular techniques and genomics to water testing. And then finally, Prit Kocheka, Kotesh, Boy, after you telling me how to say it, I dropped that one pretty badly. Pritt works in sustainability at Suncor Energy as a manager of water strategy and solutions. My apologies, That's Pritt. Fine. Pritt has over 14 years experience in the sustainable design of water systems for various business sectors, including municipal agriculture, mining, refining, and manufacturing. He works at Suncor, involved in a number of uh, developing a number of strategic water plans, technology solutions, and executing projects to reduce water usage, increasing efficiencies, and improving effluent water quality. So please uh, give a quick round of applause for these three very interesting people. Thank you for joining us. So I'm going to take my seat here and probably turn to uh, Gemma first, if that's all right. Um, Gemma, in the spirit of uh, a call to action, but also a vision of the future, and your particular area of interest in agriculture and the things that really motivate you. Uh, I think we've got about 30 minutes here, and uh, I'm going to remain silent for most of this, but uh, we'll save a few minutes for questions at the end. Gemma, do you want to share some thoughts with us, please? Sure, Jeff. Uh, well, I guess on the theme of backcasting, I guess if you know, maybe everyone can sort of fast forward to 2050, uh, where are we going to be in 2050? Uh, we're going to have uh, more people. Um, more people means uh, more pressures on resources. And I guess from the agriculture and agri-food side of things, we talked a lot this week about increasing uh, global demand for food. Um, and then what does that mean for food production here in Canada? Um, and what does that mean for the water that the agriculture, agricultural sector in Canada uses? So I guess I think an issue there is um, an issue of productivity. Um, and for Canadian agriculture, uh, this means a huge market opportunity globally. Um, but it also raises important questions about um, how are we going to steward and, and use the water that we do have efficiently um, as we're trying to increase productivity. So I think we get back to that question of sort of more crop per drop, uh, so to speak. And uh, Kim raised the point about Alberta, so in the irrigation districts, um, they've done a really good job of increasing their water use efficiency there. And I think the, the current uh, stat at about, as of 2010, um, from Brent Patterson at Alberta Agriculture was that they're at about 70% water use efficiency in their systems, which is quite good. And um, globally, you won't find that uh, other countries have a water use efficiency at that, at that level. Some do, Israel, much higher, um, but a lot of them don't. Um, but Alberta Agriculture and, and Brent said, you know, we want to get to 90% efficiency, right? Um, so that, that's something that's sort of, I guess, on, on the radar there. 
Um, the other angle, I guess, to this uh, sort of global demand story is that uh, not necessarily in, in the developed world, but in developing countries, there's actually quite a lot of food waste that happens, right? So uh, producers have trouble getting um, all of their product to market. Um, so I've, I've heard estimates um, in India um, with fruit and veg, they're losing, say, up to 30% of the product between the farm and the market. So when we talk about you know, the increased global demand for food, there's obviously efficiencies uh, that can come into play there. So I think those are, are, are all things that, that, that can be worked on. The other thing, I guess, um, which maybe is a bit more specific, but I think um, Helmi talked to it from PepsiCo, uh, uh, and a couple of the other panelists talked about it. In the agriculture and agri-food sector, uh, we'll start to see demands from different parts of the value chain um, to, to measure and demonstrate sustainability. And that might be sustainability on the water side, that might be um, on the energy side, it might be on the uh, sort of uh, the nutrient input side. Um, and um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but um, there's sort of the well-known certification in the forestry sector, uh, Forestry Stewardship Council, FSC. Um, that was followed by the Marine Stewardship Council uh, standard that was created in about 1996. Um, and those have experienced quite uh, rapid sort of market share uptake um, in those sectors. Um, and so if I was to sort of project into the future or look further down, um, what are the other sectors that are out there that are going to experience that? And I think agriculture is one of them. And so you're going to have some of these, these big companies, um, big players in the value chain, um, start to look at, at water use along the chain. And that will get passed down to the producer level, to the farm level, um, for them to deal with measurement issues, um, which may drive change, but it'll also be, it'll also be a, um, a hard thing to grapple with. Um, and then I guess on that, that dynamic uh, when we talk about water and, and agriculture. Um, in the session, it was raised the fact that the vast majority of farms in Canada, um, from an operator standpoint, it's still about one and a half people per operation, right? So I don't know how many of you in the room own a business, but an, a business has a lot of facets to it, right? And when you're a producer and you're producing food, uh, water is only one component of what you do, right? You've got, um, you've got employees, you've got uh, food safety issues, um, trying to develop your markets, and then you've got this little thing called water. So I think as we're thinking about this issue moving forward, you have to remember that those producers at the ground level, water is one of the many things that they deal with. So like Erwin talked about his dashboard, so you know, you're the farmer, you're the CEO. Um, you have to link the water issues to, to all those other things as well. And I think, I think that integration of, of water into that broader farm management system, um, while it's already there, I, you know, that, that will be the picture moving forward, is, is how, how does that become part of that broader farm management uh, system. So I think I'll leave it there. Um, so I guess two things, so that productivity question, um, and then also sort of those value chain dynamics. So how do we see those agri-food value chains um, evolving in the future? Could I ask you a quick question then before we move sure. on? Um, I, in my mind, as a visual thinker, I, I see the, you know, the top from the bottom and the bottom to the top. So the farmers have always known a lot about water management. And then there's a lot of research that goes on. There's policy and all the things up in the stratosphere. And so you've got to work it from both sides. But is there some kind of facilitating mechanism or do you think there's some kind of short-term imperative for other groups to help bring the top to the bottom and, and facilitate that kind of collaboration and sharing? Yeah, I think, I mean, we were talking about it at lunch. Um, in Canada, there are... Um, there are these entities called the Value Chain Roundtables, or VCRTs. I think there's about 12 of them for different uh, subsectors, so beef, grains, horticulture. Um, and these roundtables meet about twice a year, and they involve people from across the value chain. Mm -hmm. So you've got your retailer there, your processor, depending on the supply chain that you're part of, all the way down to the producer, producers' associations. So I think there's a lot of room for uh, sort of collaborative work uh, at that table. Um, those would be people who wouldn't necessarily normally get together right. and talk about issues that are common to sort of their supply chain. And without going into a big history of those, how did they start? Who kind of kick-started that kind of thing and who's supporting them now? And you believe that they're successful, I guess? Well, I mean, I think, I think how else do you get around these issues, these complex supply chains, I mean, as, you know, without talking about yeah. it, right? And I think that's been a big theme of the conference is, is getting those people together and talking and um, maybe talking about issues they aren't maybe so competitive on, right? right. Um, so I don't know the exact uh, history of the VCRTs, um, but uh, 
they are, the secretariat is within Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Okay. Um, and they, but they're industry chaired, so you, you have an industry chair. Um, and industry drives the agenda and issues that are of, of importance to them. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, issues of water and sustainability more broadly um, have crept onto the agenda of several of the VCRTs. Um, so I think that's a space where that can be talked about. Terrific, exactly, about creating a safe space, you know, these collaborations, as we see another example. Maybe switching gears then over to, uh, into the West and uh, from the industry perspective, Prit, did you uh, want to share some vision of the future with us, uh, things that you're working on right now or midterm kind of strategies or enablers that you see uh, shaping up? Sure, so I'm going to continue to draw on uh, this theme of collaboration, not just because it's the key word, but, but I think it's the key to our success moving forward. Um, and, I'll, and I think um, it's through collaboration that we're going to get the innovative solutions. And what I mean by that is I'll draw an example uh, that I learned from at the Stockholm Water Week um, last year. And it was this, this large mining company that had established its water footprint global, globally. And it found that in this one area, it had its largest impact. It was 30% of its full corporate water footprint. And they said, well, how are we going to ourselves reduce our footprint? And they said, well, we can spend uh, $30 million on investing in a desalinization plant with zero liquid discharge. And for those of you who know that technology, it's extremely energy intensive. It generates solid waste that um, you have to apply somewhere, landfill, store. And um, it's a big energy, it's, it's, sorry, it's a big cost burden. And the, the, the value of that investment was something like, um, it turned out to cost them uh, $10, $10 per cubic meter that, of water that they saved. So really, really capital intensive. And before, so the engineers and you know, the guys that were all revving for, oh, we've studied all these technologies and we have figured out the best technology that's out there by this, this, this technology supplier and they, they put it in front of their leadership and they said, there's got to be a better solution out there. And so they actually then brought in their stakeholder relations group, they brought in their community investment folks, their sustainability folks, and they said, let's just take a step back, you know, kind of like this water lucian con concept, and really validate our, what are the needs of that watershed. Not our, what are our needs on our biggest footprint on this watershed, what are the needs on that watershed. They talked to the municipality, they talked to the farmers, they talked through to uh, local NGOs, the public, in an organized, systematic fashion over, the, over a period of four months. And the solution, I'll just jump to the smoking gun that they found, was taking $5 million and giving it to the local municipality so they could actually increase their water supply through groundwater network in this watershed because the groundwater limitation in that watershed, sorry, the watershed limitation was the groundwater recharge to the north. And that $5 million, which was four, four, you know, four times less the cost, um, supplied the needs of that watershed. It supplied, uh, it, they, they reallocated the licenses to the farmers and to the industries on that watershed. And it was a completely creative, non-technical solution. And by the way, I'm an environmental engineer. I studied my master's in treatment. So it's not sexy per se on a technology perspective, but it was a real solution of what that watershed needed. And it was only through collaboration that, um, that, uh, that th this, this new innovative solution was realized. It was you know, awesome business opportunity. You know, it met the, the sustainable needs for, for, that, for that area, right? So anyway, um, I heard a lot about that today with you know, the Blue Water Initiative. And you know, we, we talked a lot about innovation. I just, one thing as I'm reflecting about the future in our industry, our extractive industry, that the reason we're forming COSIA is we're saying water, air, and land are not competitive spaces for us to work in. We, we work in a finite resource, the natural step concept. And these are the CEOs of our, uh, or the heads of our companies that are saying this. You know, they're really, without thinking it, they're adopting the Rocky Mountain Institute principles of finite state. Without even them realizing it, they're probably following the vision of David Suzuki's concept around this resource being finite. You know what I mean? So, you know, it's, it's just, uh, it's through that collaboration that we're gonna come to this better space, so. Terrific example. David Suzuki's uh, uh, cheeks are blushing here somewhere <laughs> in, the, in the world. 
Um, I love that concept of active, um, of appreciative inquiry is one term for it, where you reach out into the community to you know, find out, as per Gemma's example, of what are the best examples. How, um, how is this one publicized? Like, are, are you are broadcasting this one, or are you getting a lot of response to that one from different parts of the world? How are people highlighting these kind of successes? We come to conferences, and we're all like-minded folks that we're sharing stories with one another. Do you think there's a a better way to broadcast those kind of successes to the, the common folk, if I can call it that? Well, you know, it's all nice for all, to all, all of us to know about this, but to me it's about the decision makers and influencers, right? So this, this concept was presented at a World Business Council for Sustainable Development event. It was by the private sector. But, you know, I, here I am in an extractive industry, you know, 2,000 miles over in Canada, and this was a lesson learned from South Africa. Mm -hmm. I actually brought that back to my VP, and we're actually, we have a project called Regional Solutions where we're looking at very similar concepts, right? So, I mean, it's, it's nice for others to hear about it. I, I think it's more important for the, um, it's more important for the decision makers and influencers to actually you know, um, learn about this, right? And I think it's through dialogues like this, right? It's a very small community where, where, where we're all sharing. And I mean, you can look at the space of, you know, we, we, we talked last night for, the, for about two hours, totally different sector, public health, agriculture, and industry. And I think it really, you know, it came down to us seeing the commonality in, in opportunities. And, you know, they weren't, um, uh, they're not opportunities that are, that are you know, um, technical or economic. It's really just coming down to basics about what our needs are. So, great. Okay, great example. We'll switch to Natalie. Natalie, your thoughts on uh, where things are going, where they should be going. Um, so I think I'll start with um, when I first arrived at this conference. I scanned the room, and I was surprised by how few people I actually knew. And that was a little bit. Um, I, I was wondering where are my public public health folk? Where are my partners in health? Um, and so I was initially a little frustrated, but then I realized that you know, the types of partnerships that we have had traditionally are not the ones that we need going forward to, to be collaborative and to be actionable. Um, I remember when I started my PhD, it was a big thing that engineer, I was co-supervised by an engineer and a public health microbiologist, and that was innovative, public health and engineers working together. I think we've moved way past that, that's the norm, and now we have to look into other strategic um, collaborations that can help move things forward. Um, we talk a lot in these conferences, and I think there's a lot of talk and a little bit less action than, than we really want to see. And I think that's one of Bernadette's um, themes is, you know, this call to action. How can we actually act on these, on these good ideas? How can we make them happen? Um, and I want to draw on an example in the public health field. Um, I work in environmental health, but I, I'm also um, a, a microbiologist. I work in a clinical microbiology lab. And in co-housed in my building is um, routine diagnostics for HIV, for um, influenza. During the pan, the pan flu or the pandemic influenza of 2009-2010, they were able to get a test to, to be validated and approved for clinical use in 24 hours. Um, here in the drinking water industry, we're still in a situation where we take up to 30 hours to transport a water sample to a laboratory and 18 to 48 hours to be able to get that test. And lots of people said it, um, said it earlier today. You, you can't recall water. By the time somebody, we know the test result, people have already consumed that water. Now let's contrast that to some of the things we can do in the clinical microbiology lab. We're at a point where we can test for HIV and we can t test for tuberculosis while the patient waits in the doctor's office. Why can't we do that for water? And what, is, what are the barriers to getting us to do that for water? And I think that there needs to be some innovation and I think that the technologies are out there because if we can do it in clinical microbiology, we should be able to do it for water. They're, they're pathogens, they're, they're microbes, they're the same things. But we somehow need to be able to get over some of these barriers that keep us from trying new innovations. And so I think it's these unusual partnerships, um, bringing together um, industry, bringing together, you know, working with municipalities, working with sort of our non-traditional partners and trying to move things along. And I think that's the way we're going to start to change the water industry. So 2050, what I want to see is I want to see um, a pH dipstick to be able to test water. So I know that if I can swim in that beach or if I know that I should drink that water, whether it's here locally in Canada or when I'm traveling abroad. So, but that's a, we have a ways to get there. We're still culturing E. coli. I'm gonna tap into your passion right now, Natalie, and put you on the spot. What are you gonna do this week, this month, this year to, to see that vision happen? What are you gonna do personally? Or what would you like to do if you were free from the confines of your current employer, perhaps? 
Um, but, <laughs> well, yeah, you're right. I have. I Let's have say you've a, got a blank check. No <laughs> disparity against your current employer. Let's just say you, you've um, just won the career lottery and you can do whatever you want. Um, that, that's a great question. I don't think I have an answer to it. Um, I would probably. Um, I try to build, um, draw on industries that are really fast moving and try to understand how they, they are so quick moving and how I can get technology to action. So how can we validate things really quickly? How can we have influence over legislators to try new things, to try new tests? Um, and so I would want to work in, I would be, I would, I'd want to be on the you know, ground floor trying to try these new technologies and try to move things along um, quickly and just take a risk. I mean, that's the big thing is sometimes we have to take risks and sometimes we, we were talking about that at lunch today. Sometimes um, here in Canada, we ex we're expected to have a really good idea and we're supposed to be successful at it. We aren't really given a lot of opportunity for failure. And so, you know, it'd be worth trying something out that might not work and be willing to take that risk. Here, here. I'll pick up on that then and I might go out on a limb professionally myself here, but I'll tell a little story about how we're you know, doing something that's innovative and maybe a little risky, and it's, you know, it's going outside the normal box, perhaps. And it's around this element of risk, right? This theme that has come up many times during this conference here, and as conservative Canadians, you know, we'd be terrified to step on someone's toes or, or make a, a wrong move or something. But I'm really concerned, personally speaking, I'm really concerned that, you know, we're going to, we're going to fall down the rung here. I think it was Kelly or somebody mentioned about, uh, you know, the uh, number of innovations or the, on the rank on the list, we were number five and we're sliding down or something like this. And then Nick Parker said, you know, you have to expect that. The reason we have to expect that, of course, is because other places are in much more dire circumstances. And so it occurs to me that nothing like fear, and everybody knows this, of course, nothing like fear motivates you. And we don't have a lot of fear in Canada because we're sitting next to so much water and we've always had, you know, a politically stable entity and country here and, and environment. So what I try and do is, uh, speaking to our gentleman speaker last night around risk, is um, affect external, external risk or externalities, highlight those things so that it's clear to people that you know, we, there's, we're in danger of losing something here. We're gonna lose our competitive advantage. We're gonna lose our place as global leaders in water management. And uh, so one call to action perhaps for everybody is to go out and put the fear of God in somebody in this country here so that this audience is twice as big next year and twice as big every year after that. I'm sure all your spouses and partners like mine are you know, up to here with all your, your water statistics and doom and gloom. But fear is an incredibly powerful motivator and that's why Singapore and that's why South Sub-Saharan Africa and these people are coming up with such innovative technologies because they, they know what we don't and they're lacking what we have. So, um, I'm working on a little project. It's, in, it's based in India, and we were talking about this one at lunchtime. And it's just such a, uh, just such a water constrained environment that they are willing to try anything. And you know, that's the kind of courage that we have to have. What we're learning there should be transplantable back into the developed country. So this is uh, rural remote villages in the middle of India. Why, doesn't, why can't we transplant that technology back into rural and remote parts of, of Canada and North America? This urbanization trend is a real phenomenon that we talk about a lot in IBM, but it means that those rural communities are experiencing a brain drain and they're strained for resources and their tax base is dropping and so they're, they're under even more pressure perhaps than the urban centers. We've got opportunities to collaborate with global partners. We've got, every, we've got all the water in the world. We've got a lot of talent. We've got three young superheroes right here. We've got to go out on that limb. And uh, so that's one of the things that I'm doing. That's my personal call to action is to try and influence more people and also go outside the normal box here. Go outside our comfort zone and try and collaborate and cross-pollinate with other groups. And so I think that uh, we've talked about those things a little bit. We talked about the vision of the future. Did anybody have on the panel either personal stories that you've experienced already, you want to try and replicate that or other things you're going to do this year? Not a story of what I'm going to do this year, but I did want to um, reflect on back to that e idea that there weren't as many public health practitioners here as they, they're, they're, that I thought there would be. And I want to reflect on something that Steve Hrudy said in one of his sessions, was that underlying um, all the work that we do, every single one of us here, we're either trying to promote public health or we're trying to promote environmental health by having good water quality, good infrastructure, and that we're all public health practitioners. Um, and that drinking water operators are the ultimate public health practitioner. And that was something that I was able to go home and reflect about. And I think that I can go forward and try to encourage, you know, in these collaborations and interacting with people who don't think they're public health practitioners to, to try and promote that. And I think that might be an effective way of promoting the, the message of water. And then there was the other thought that I had from the sessions where was um, Ian Douglas, 
I'm not sure if he's still here, but he also reflected on trying to think of some of the positive values of water, some of the things that we don't tend to think about water. Water is something that everybody needs. Everyone expects to be pure, but nobody really thinks about. And I really liked how he was able to bring a positive sense to water instead of being doom and gloom all the time, trying to sort of celebrate th those aspects of water. I guess uh, in terms of sort of a call to action, I guess some of my experiences uh, sort of really emphasize the importance of thinking about the end user. So we've talked about that a little bit at the conference, but I guess from the agricultural standpoint, um, we ta we sp we've spent a lot of time, a lot of academics in this room have spent time researching uh, BM what we call BMPs or beneficial management practices. Um, and the idea being that you can come up with some sort of innovation, um, it's good for the environment, it might have some economic benefits, these win-win solutions. Um, and, and you develop them and then, you know, let them loosen, and, and the idea is people should adopt them, right? Because it's the right thing to do or because it's going to be economically beneficial. Um, and sometimes the ones where the research says it's win-win still aren't adopted. Um, and I, I was re recently working on a project, a uh, student that was doing their master's, uh, where we had a particular BMP, which the research said was a win-win, so economic benefits, environmental benefits. Um, but it wasn't being adopted. And this is just, just east of, of Ottawa. So we went out and did some research. Um, and so the initial hypothesis was, well, maybe producers just don't know about it. So maybe there's a lack of awareness. Um, so we covered that off, and it turned out, no, no, they'd heard of it. It was out there. Um, so then we started digging a little bit deeper. And it turned out that it, you know, in a lot of ways, um, the groundwork just hadn't been done in terms of you know, whether producers wanted this technology um, and whether uh, the contractors who would work with them on the technology um, had the tools they needed to promote the technology, um, and also whether those contractors had the economic incentive to promote it. So it's one thing to do that R&D and, and to throw it out there and sort of throw, you know, do this sort of supply-driven thing, but if the demand isn't there and the end users don't want it, well, you know, what are we spending our time on? And I mean, I think farmers are just one example. I mean, I don't, I'm trying to think of, I think I've, I've heard from one producer, maybe two producers actually at the conference, are there any other producers in the room? You know, so those are the end users. We had a whole track on agriculture, right? So we're having, we're talking a lot about these solutions and, and that sort of thing, but um, you know, the person on the ground making those day-to-day -day land management decisions, um, how much of a part of a conversation are they? So I guess I would challenge, I challenge, I always challenge myself and challenge the rest of you, whatever field you're working in, whatever your end user is, um, to have a conversation with them. And even in the confines of your job, it might be difficult to do that. Um, you know, there's probably already always some sort of way um, to make that connection. So. so maybe one midterm action for all of us is to bring a peer or someone that we feel is lacking from one of the sectors to next year's conference. So. Well, and I think, and I can see the time, we probably want to leave some room for questions. I guess for me, the big reflection point has been really happened in the last two years. And it really is that um, we are the ambassadors of water to Canada and really to the world. It's a small place. And I guess what I mean by that is that we really have to be the change that we want to see the world, that we want to see the change in the world. Exactly what, what we're talking about here in the sense that um, people don't all have the right information. They don't know everything. I mean, and if we could help to influence and inform and, and talk to the influencers, you know, like I think, you know, all of us, I'm guessing we're all under 40, you know, I don't think there should be any reason whether it, it's our deputy minister or our minister or the CEO of our company or, you know, the chief of some NGO, why we just can't go and talk to them about, you know, they're just, people are people. They only have their own thoughts and ideas. And I guess to me, I think we, we have to have that courage that you said to go and have those informed discussions. And I actually think we'll get a lot further that way instead of trying to always be so nice and, and trying to like work at the, you know, work it at this level and then three years later bring it at this level. Like let's get things happening. And I think all of us are the leaders of, of the country, I guess I look at it that way, right? So That's great point, Prit. Let me add to that and ask each of you uh, one to deliver one message here and then we'll turn it over for questions. There's younger folks in the room. We were young not that long ago. We've uh, come through our academic career. Now we're out in the field. We're practicing. Word of advice or courage, or is it uh, just not be so nice to uh, students and younger folks who might be here? Prit, maybe you've answered that already. Did you want to add to that? Or uh, no, no. I mean, I, I think <laughs> maybe not too nice is not what I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> Was I putting words in your yeah, mouth? Yeah, I guess there? I did say that. Right? <laughs> or too nice. Um, 
No, I mean, I, I guess it's just um, to, to, to not let, uh, we had this interesting discussion at our table last night, to not let um, artificial hierarchical boundaries um, limit our ability to influence change. And artificial hierarchical boundaries are, are, are ones that are set with organizational charts mm -hmm. or our own perceptions or feeling. I mean, North America, we're lucky our culture actually has brought that down quite a bit versus other, other countries, right? And I think, I think that's, our, that's our, um, uh, our value that we can actually add, you know, really, really, really take that courage and, and have those discussions at the next level. And, uh, and I think that will allow us to, to advance things faster. Here, here. Natalie, speaking to the folks maybe in your sector or your field who are coming up, words of wisdom or advice? Well, I just want to build what, I'm, um, what Pritz just said. I think that um, taking a risk and talking to people and being willing to take a chance that may, you know, have a conversation you didn't expect to have, approach people that you don't think would normally talk to you. I think that everyone, everyone wants to hear about from you. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, some of the best um, leaders and mentors that I've had in my life were people that I've met at conferences that I, you know, went up and I'm like, I think you're famous. Can you talk to me? Yeah. Um, <laughs> totally. And I think that you have to be willing to do that. And even beyond, even once you're not a young professional anymore, or you're not a student anymore and you're a young professional, or even in other parts of your life, just being able to, willing to have conversations with anyone. And I think that those, those hierarchies aren't doing any, us any good. And, and then the second thing I want to suggest is find a mentor. Find someone you really like who can help mm -hmm. guide you through it. Because they're the ones who are going to help introduce you to people. They're the ones who are going to make suggestions. They're going to tell you how things are. And, um, and I think that's really key is good mentorship. And I came through CWN. I was an HQP. I was on a project. That's how this, my career built, was built. And um, I'm really thankful to CWN. And that exposed me to those mentors. And I think that we have to encourage, um, encourage those mentorship positions. That's great. Thanks, Natalie. Gemma? Yeah, and I guess the flip side, I mean, so if you're, you know, you're young, go out and seek mentors. But I also speak to those of you in the room who are leaders in your field, who are senior leaders in your field. Um, you all have something to offer uh, those that are junior to you. So don't be afraid to offer, offer mentorship, too. Um, you know, students should ask for it, but it's, you also need to offer it. Um, and if, if you think you don't have anything to offer, you're wrong, because you do, because you have experience. Um, and, and young professionals and students, sim sometimes they just want to hear your career story. Mm -hmm. So just tell them about you know, how you got from A to Z, right? They would really appreciate hearing that. And sometimes they don't want to ask it, because they think it's a little bit personal. Um, but if you offer it up, um, they'd like to hear those stories. So I think don't be, don't be afraid to do that. Um, and then the other plug I will do, because Karen had to leave, um, go back to Toronto, is uh, Opportunities like Waterlution for students, young professionals are a great way to build your networks. Um, in my job, a lot of what I do is networking. Mm -hmm. um, I can get the job done so much faster if I know who to pick up the phone and call or who to email, right? And the only way to build those, con well, I think I, my personal belief is um, different cultures have different ideas, you know, so many cups of tea before you sort of let into the, the family sort of thing. But I, I do believe that meeting face to face the first time and then building an electronic relationship after that. You, know, you have to have that initial face-to-face -face right. meeting. And things like Waterlution or this conference are a really good opportunity to build that, that beginning of that relationship. Um, so if you're a student and young professional and you're going to be looking for work or looking for transitioning to different types of careers, um, those are really, really good opportunities to do that. Great advice, Gemma. And I can attest to that. I mean, it's all about the network. And, mm -hmm. uh, we talk about a lot about collaboration at this conference and a lot of these conferences, and maybe, to Gemma's point, the, the most important collaboration of all is that intergenerational collaboration. So make sure that you're building your networks uh, you know, age-wise as well as uh, within your sector and, and beyond. So we've got about uh, this countdown timer here is nine <laughs> minutes to blast off, I guess. Or, so we've got 10 minutes-ish. Uh, if there's any questions, we'll open it up to the floor and uh, I thank my panel. I promised you I'd ask you. Thank you, Beverly. So you're very welcome. Good to your word. Um, so my name is Beverly Saunders. Just got my master's. I've asked a few questions, so I'm sure most of you know who I am. Um, not because I'm famous, though. Uh, so um, you talked briefly, just mentioned it, the idea of putting fear into people <laughs> and making them motivated that way. But from experience, I find that that's short-lived that kind of motivation and actually I think the theme of this conference was more motivating people by making it relate in a good way to the way the things that are happening in their in their businesses or their lives or whatever and have that um, sort of be their motivator so I, I'd like to hear maybe a little bit of 
discussion on that, just because from what I've seen, fear doesn't really motivate for that long. And I appreciate you putting me in my place. I, uh, <laughs> I, live, I, I live in a world of fear, I think. I live in a multinational company with the pressures that uh, we put ourselves under is a bit ridiculous. And so I do see a lot of the global perspective and I do believe that there are external factors that other people are, you know, working to their advantage. Uh, but you're absolutely right. It's, it's short lived that it's not the way we operate in Canada or any else. So uh, thank you for your comments on that. Did, uh, did anybody want to well, comment to, on to other Jeff's ways defense. of motivating us? <laughs> for at, at lunch, we actually did, he actually said this to us, make sure we're not talking about the gloom and doom. And, and, and I don't think we have been. It, to me, is talking about the opportunities that come out of those potential risks that we heard, right? And, and, and building on the connections, the, the water, water energy, um, the food nexus, and, and how all of this could lead to opportunities, right? And so I think, to me, um, when you go to someone, uh, oh, actually, well, um, our speaker last night gave that, exam, that example. He said, when there, there's, there's actual psychological research done on this in the social sciences. When you go to someone, you say, um, you're going to lose, um, you know, $100 million, so I need you to do this for me. I need you to spend a couple million dollars. You switch that and say, hey, you have the opportunity to gain you know, a hundred million dollars cost you the same amount of money, just all of a sudden there's this, okay, well, what does that mean for me, right? And so I think, I think you know, we all know the opposite of risk is opportunity, and I think, I know Jeff was talking about that to us too, look at, look at these risks as our opportunities or our, our um, um, ability to kind of um, move things forward, so. Thanks, Britt, and, and, and to your point then, Beverly, some people out there, outside of these type of conferences, don't understand the risk. So putting the fear of God in them was perhaps a strong statement, but if we can outline the risks to them in that context of here's the opportunities for Canada and young leaders and industry and people uh, you know, all across the country, then uh, so it's a two-part step, it's a two-step action, I guess. Outline those risks and then the opportunities within there. Thanks, Prit. Other comments from Natalie or Gemma? No, I think that's, I think you've covered it. I'm, it, I'm, I guess one point, I, I'm thinking back a couple weeks ago, I was watching um, a webinar um, and uh, heard from Andy Wales at Sab Miller. Some of you have probably met Andy. Um, and, and he, yeah, and he, uh, he had a quote from Paul Dickinson at the Carbon Disclosure Project. And Paul's quote, some of you probably heard it, he says, if, he says, if climate change is a shark, then water is its teeth. And I've, I thought that's a really interesting mm -hmm. way to put it, right? Um, because we, we, we do talk about climate change in the context of risk and it being this scary thing, this, this sort of scary shark. Um, but I think you, we can articulate the risks, but you have to immediately turn to the opportunity. And when you're talking about the opportunities and the risks, you have to put them in the context of whoever it is you're talking to. Mm -hmm. So again, I mean, not necessarily the end user, but the sector or, you know, what's driving them. So yep. what, are their, what is their incentive structure? What, what motivates them, right? And then, and, and then steer the story there. I think sometimes if we talk about water risk, Generally, in general, yeah. you're you're going to lose lose it because yeah. you're talking to these CEOs or you know ministers who have this complex dashboard. It's too big for them to get You know, their head and it's in the media, and, and they sort of hear this this broad story, but they don't necessarily know how it relates to them. Um, and I mean, part of our job, I think, you know, in in the at the levels that we are, is is making you know, those, those contextualizing, contextualizing and making those connections, yeah. right? Very so. good, great. For the record, sharks do scare the put the fear of God in me. <laughs> so I'm not sure the gentleman on the left was next. <clears throat> uh, I just want to bring to everyone's attention something that everyone knows, that we consist uh, to 98% of water. So what I've been hearing here is water talking to water. And just listening to the panelists, it was refreshing to hear the brooks of knowledge flowing. <laughs> and uh, I don't know whether, if you abstract the words from what you hear, you just hear the sound of water. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I found that fascinating. And this brings back the, this idea of sharing, um, because in sharing the, lies the solution to water pollution, and uh, because everything that flows purifies itself. Uh, so I think sharing knowledge about water in itself is the solution. And just to give you an idea, um, I can picture uh, a play for young children to bring home to them the idea of water 
<clears throat> a, a girl or a boy has to bring water to a target somewhere off. Now, if others cling on to him and say, hey, I want to have some water, and so he'll come to the target, and there will be no more water in the vessel. But if everyone says, come on, let, let me move the obstacles from your path, everyone cooperates, then the water gets carried to the target. That's so a lovely metaphor. Much. Thank you for sharing that. I guess if we all come together, there's nothing we can't do, right? And so that's why we have these conferences. That's why they're so important. Thank you for that comment. Did you guys have any response to that one? We've got a couple minutes winding down here, and there's another question or two. I believe in the middle, were you next, sir, or please? Hi, Thank Bob you. Russ from uh, water.ca. Uh, you talk about fear. There's 35 reses right now with don't touch the water orders on the reses. I mean, instead of, uh, we should go to conferences like this, but I think more people should be out there. Mm -hmm. if you want to know, hi there, CBC. Uh, this is poisonous water in front of us. Are you going to come and help? Uh, Right now, there's 1,600 ball water advisories in Canada. We have every reason to be nervous about water completely. Uh, what I'm wondering is, through this, I didn't hear anything about uh, explaining to my 12-year-old daughter uh, where she's going to be in 10 years in regards to water. And uh, this, this is kind of getting on my mind. There's, there is an awful lot to worry about. And uh, fear is a great weapon, and we should be using that. Thank you. So Beverly, I'm back to using putting the fear of God in people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> indeed, I, I agree. I mean, there's nothing quite like it. Uh, somebody was saying, was it our, our lunchtime discussion about uh, young children in um, Palestine, or that was breakfast this morning, about young children in the Middle East, and uh, they're, they're told about uh, the lack of safe water. And uh, it was a very young child who had made the comment to somebody who had been there, and it's one of you in the audience, I think, who was telling me this story. But uh, I mean, I have a child. I'm very concerned about it as well. How do we get that message to them without scaring the, the heck out of them? But it, and as other people have said, we have to start this very early. The sooner, the better. Uh, the yeah, earlier that they appreciate this. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to draw on an experience that um, in British Columbia, if you try ever to throw out a can of Pepsi or a, any, can, any metal can into the garbage, random people on the street mm -hmm. will yell at you. And so how did we get to the point where it became so bad to pollute with um, or to not recycle? And, it was be and um, we, we had a lot of conversations about what, what has been the driver to these, this, this culture of recycling um, because it is a faux pas to throw things in the garbage. Um, and I'm sure it happens across Canada, but it's very particular in British Columbia. Um, and the driver was children's education. And so at a young age, children were taught that they have to recycle and you cannot put that can in the garbage. And they went home and they, um, I guess they put the pressure on their parents. And so they built up this, we, we have a generation of recyclers and those recyclers put the pressure on their parents to also be recyclers. And I think that in some ways we need to do that in the water industry as well, to promote um, you know, better usage of water, to be stewards of water, to not waste water. And I think that has to happen at a young age. And so, I mean, the boiled water advisors are a, to a different topic and we need to be able to address those in ways of having um, better water quality and you know, think about why some of those BWAs exist. But if we look you know, sort of more widely and we're looking at trying to build this future of people who care about water, I think we need to start in grade one. And that education needs to be part of the curriculum, grades one to 12. And that's something that all of us can contribute to by um, helping some of those programs that um, promote stream rehabilitation and children's knowledge of water. And there is a sense of urgency around this, right? We've got to take the gloves off, perhaps. Uh, the gentleman in the middle, and then maybe on the left, and then uh, I, we're into overtime already here. Somebody will just yank the hook across my neck, I guess, if we go way into overtime. Sir. Hi, Alex Chick, Canadian Water Network. Um, my question or uh, comment for discussion is, on the very first day of the conference, we had this uh, Students and Young Professional Committee get together. And one thing that I noticed when I stepped into the room was that I was in the room full of women. <laughs> really interesting because attending all these technical be worse. conferences, usually it's all guys. So what is it that uh, with the new generation, what are we doing right to inspire women to be leaders like Bernadette we have? Where is she? There she is. 
how do we inspire the next generation of women to get involved in the water industry and to nurture that talent? We happen to have what two women right here on the panel. How about, happy coincidence. What inspired you two? What did we do right? Um, my, me my mentors for in water, <laughs> um, my mentors in water were other women and I have to admit that I also tend to promote women in water and I think it's just one of those things where I think the water industry, I mean I go to a lot of technical conferences and a lot of those technical conferences are still mostly men um, and that's not a bad thing, that's just the way that, that it historically has been but I think that um, women promoting women is, um, is a good thing. Yeah, I mean same for me, um, you're seeing um, you know, women in those leadership positions. Um, that's been it, my sort of fellow women. Um, although, I mean, I work where I work right now. Um, most of my managers are not women. Uh, so, you know, I, I think there's still a lot of room for women in leadership positions. And, you know, I, so I always encourage women that are in those leadership positions uh, to mentor uh, women that are junior to them. So I think that's important. Um, and I mean, men have a role in that too, um, to encourage women to, Step up. Thank Great. You. Thank you. <laughs> In honor of the of the woman who's uh, driving this ship, uh, we'll uh, wrap it up. We're into overtime here. I want to thank my panelists very much again. Thank you for your time and, and participation this afternoon. And uh, Bernadette, whoever is going to secede us on the podium here, please uh, please come up and thank you.